Welcome to the Feeling Better Podcast. My name is Maria, and I'm the host of this podcast, former gambling addict, and devoted Christian homesteading wife. I'm also the author of the Feeling Better 10-4 program that teaches you a practical, effective, inspirational 10-week program to help you overcome your compulsive gambling addiction, which you can listen to in the first 15 episodes of my podcast. Thanks so much for being here. My apologies, friends, for not getting an episode out last weekend. It was crazy around here. We got dumped on with snow. Like, we'd gotten about seven inches of snow earlier in the week, and then when the big blizzard came, it brought down another 15 inches, so altogether we had nearly two feet of snow that had fallen in only a matter of days. The wind was nuts, so some of the drifts were well over the top of my thighs. Normally, I would love a snowstorm like that, but with those big winds came big drops in temperature. I know most of the U.S. has experienced ridiculously cold temperatures this week, and thank God for our wood stove, because without it, the cost of propane, which we would use to heat the house without the wood stove, would be outrageous. We haven't filled our tank in close to a year now. How we didn't lose power with 15 inches of snowfall and high winds is truly a miracle from God. Anyway, before I dive into today's topic, I've got three quick stories to share about mercy and grace. One is a lesson on how I could have been more merciful last week, but wasn't. And another is a story about how someone extended grace onto me when I didn't deserve it. And the third story is a story of how God was both merciful and graceful to me. Now, for those who are new, allow me to reiterate the definitions of each, because they're sometimes vague. Often we tend to use the word graceful to mean someone, usually a woman, who is elegant and has a refined artistic beauty about them, or who moves in a beautiful, elegant way, like a graceful ballerina. But the word grace or graceful in a biblical sense means giving someone a blessing or gift when they don't deserve it. Jesus is an example of God's grace, right? It means ignoring the sin or the bad things a person has done and showering us with love and blessings and gifts anyway. Mercy is when someone did something bad or sinful or acted in a sinful way and deserves punishment, condemnation, or judgment, but it's withheld from them. It's an act of mercy, Like, God not condemning us to death each day for all the sinful things we do is merciful. Not throttling your teenager and grounding them for a week when they left their smelly gym bag in the trunk of your car and now stink up the whole vehicle is an act of mercy. These stories I'm about to tell you hit with perfect timing for this episode, which is about the imbalance of character and integrity, chapter 8 of my book, The Addict's Guide to Fixing Our Broken Lives. In this chapter, I'm going to be talking about doing what is right when no one is watching. Anyway, the first story I feel wretched about. It just goes to show you how stupidly human I can be sometimes, even when I think I'm growing stronger and wiser and more righteous in my faith. So Saturday morning, we knew the blizzard was going to arrive in the afternoon, One of my favorite listener friends, who I'll call Jay, because I don't know if she wants me to use her real name or not, loves meteorology, which is weather. We both love weather, and we were just joking back and forth about how many forecasters often don't get it right, and yet we continue to hold them to high standards, hoping they do. Ryan Hall, y'all, is one of our faves. Hi, Jay. I just wanted to say hello to you on air, and I hope you got my last email. I know sometimes it takes me a while to get back. I don't mean to do that. I used to be really good at responding to emails in a timely fashion, but lately I've just been so busy that sometimes the days just get away from me. So my husband and I began to get things ready. We made sure all the oil lamps had oil in them and that the headlamps and flashlights had batteries and the phone chargers were charged up and the bathtub filled with water to flush toilets in case the power went out. So while I did all of that stuff, my husband went outside to load up the wood. First, he brought in two big piles to stack in front of the wood stove. I know sometimes I've called it a fireplace here on this podcast, but it's really a cast iron wood stove. Sometimes I just say things for easy understanding to those who may live in different countries and not know what I mean. 
So then he went outside to load up the pile on the porch. Our woodshed that holds all of our wood is at the back of the property. So what he does is takes our four-wheeler ATV and hooks a sled to the back of it. He fills the sled with wood and drives it to the front of the house. Then he loads the porch with it. So we have Starlink internet. If not for Starlink, I would not have a podcast. We have no cell service in a two-mile radius around our home. I'm not sure why, but we're in a tiny pocket of dead service. If you go out to the main road about two miles from us, you can pick up a bar, maybe even two on a good day. And then from there, as you head south or east, you'll pick up a better signal. North or west is still kind of sketchy. Also, there is no internet provider here. None. No landline phone service, no Verizon, no AT&T, no Frontier or Spectrum, or WOW, or whatever else there might be. The only option when we first moved here was HughesNet, which is ridiculously expensive and caps your internet data. So once you hit that cap, you get throttled down. So we have a huge open field to the side of the house, which has an awesome line of sight for the Starlink satellite. When we got it, we plunked it down in the field and ran the thick outdoor cable to the house through a corner in the window. We should have buried the cable. That would have been the right thing to do. That's what it's designed for. But in all honesty, my hubby's motto sometimes is good enough. He can be a bit on the lazy side when it comes to doing things the right way. And I'm not capable of digging a 40-foot trench on my own, so we just took the cable and pulled it over top of our propane tank so that my husband would remember it was there when he mowed the lawn on our riding lawnmower, rather than mowing over it, which would be bad. So there I was in the house. I was in the living room plugging in some phone battery pack chargers to make sure they were fully charged while my husband was outside on the four-wheeler, also known as a quad, hauling wood up to the porch. When all of a sudden, I heard a huge bang. I whirled around and I saw our recliner chair over by the outside wall in the corner, rocking back and forth. At first, I thought it was an earthquake or something, but then I quickly noted that nothing else seemed to be rocking or moving. Then I heard my husband cursing loudly over the rumbling engine of the quad. I gasped then, realizing that he must have lost control and crashed into the side of the house so badly that it moved the recliner that sat under the window right up against the wall in the corner. In my furry slippers, I ran out into the snowy porch and peered around the side of the house. I saw him standing there shaking his head. You okay? I asked, concerned but relieved to see that he was upright and standing. He was clearly okay, but was the house? Did we have a big hole in our siding that would need to be repaired? Yeah, I'm fine. I just snapped the Starlink cable, he said, frustrated. What? No, not the Starlink cable. Immediately, I knew what he'd done. Since the cable to the satellite rests on top of the propane tank, it's about at chest level. Ever since we've had the service, we've carefully ensured that we keep enough slack to lift it up over our heads to duck under if we're passing by that way. Whenever he mows the lawn, I always tell him to be careful, and sometimes I even go out to hold it up for him while he's riding back and forth. That cable is always handled with the utmost care, and we never even drive on that side of the house, ever. But I knew immediately what had happened. He didn't want to take the long way around the house because it was cold and blustery, and instead of getting off the quad and moving the cable behind him, he just lifted it up and flung it behind as he drove under it. Only the cord got caught on the rack on the back of the quad, and as he kept going, the cable became taut and snapped in two. Inside the house, the cable runs behind the recliner chair along the wall, so when the cable pulled taut, it pushed the recliner forward. And then when it snapped violently, the chair rocked backward and slammed against the wall. That's what I'd heard and why I saw it rocking. I'm not going to lie, I lost it. I just lost it. We had no money left after paying our bills out of that $2,500 my hubby had earned from that client job. I knew it would be days, maybe even a week before we could get a new cable delivered. And I knew they weren't cheap. The internet was vital to our livelihood.
It was how I applied for jobs, how we did contract work, essentially how we stayed connected to the outside world. Because without our Starlink internet, we don't even have cell service. I knew those cables were so expensive and that we just didn't have the money. I stomped around the living room in a panic, knowing that we didn't have the money to buy another cable. And on top of that, we were on the cusp of a major winter blizzard. Even if we did order one, it would be at least a week before it arrived to us way out here in the country. My husband finally came into the house, carrying the Starlink satellite dish with the broken cable wrapped around his arm. I don't know, I said, throwing up my arms. Maybe I can put a shout out on Facebook, ask some of our friends if anyone has an extra cable. Then I peered closer at the satellite dish. We have the very first generation satellite that came out, and we've had it for about four years. It's round, and the cable appeared to be fused and connected as one piece to the dish. I couldn't see any way to remove it. I had assumed it just snapped in there somehow, but for the life of me, I couldn't find a way to disconnect it. Frustrated, I texted a friend of ours who did a lot of research on Starlink before he got his service, and he's pretty tech savvy. But what I learned almost sent me to my knees. That first generation dish doesn't have the capability of disconnecting the cable. It's all one piece, all connected together. If the wire goes bad, you have to replace the entire thing, the satellite dish and all. I did some Googling and saw that Starlink made some changes to that in the second and third generation, but ours was indeed toast. I began to really freak out then. Replacing the dish and the hardware was $600. Definitely money that we didn't have. My hobby peered at the cut cable. I think I can fix this, he said. Splice it together. I rolled my eyes at him. You can't fix this. It's not fixable. We have to replace the whole stupid thing. And how are we going to do that? How could you let this happen? For years, I have constantly warned to be careful about that cable. I go outside and help you lift it up when you mow the lawn. And we don't even let anyone walk on that side of the house. How could you have flung it behind you so carelessly like that? You should have gotten off the quad, moved the cable, and carefully continued on. For a good half hour, while he had a headlamp on working on trying to splice the cable together, I just went on and on about his carelessness and how much it was going to impact our lives. I didn't let up. In all those weeks of peace and joy and contentment, this situation totally unhinged me. It was a mistake, I understood, but it was a costly one one that could have been avoided, one that I never would have made, righteous as I was. But while he worked, I kept saying, just forget about it. You're not going to be able to fix it. It's pointless. I seethed and I paced and I tried in every which way I could to figure out what we were going to do. I knew my husband. He was good at some things, but this sort of thing was definitely not his forte. This is the kind of situation that, during my time gambling, would have sent me straight to my phone to try to get a little money with a win on the casino app. Of course, that was not anything I was going to entertain now, but what was I going to do? Of course, I knew what to do. I prayed. I had no idea how it was going to work out, but once again, like I said, I gave it to God. I had been practicing that for weeks, and eventually that was the conclusion I came to, that I just had to mentally pack up my Starlink ensemble and put it all into a box, and then I had to hand that box over to Jesus. This is too big for me, God. Please help me out here. I can't take something like this right now. Later on, I heard my husband call out from the living room. Okay, I think I've got it. I'm going to head outside. Will you pass me the satellite dish through the window so I can set it up back in its place? I sighed, knowing it was fruitless. Still, I couldn't help but to have a little hope. When he got everything set in place and came back inside, we plugged the cable in and waited. It's not going to work, I insisted. It's going to work, he insisted back. We waited and nothing. See, I said accusingly, the light's not even coming on. But just then, I saw the tiny white light on our router. The satellite dish is calibrating, my husband said confidently. 
It's moving. I opened up the Starlink app and saw the message that our service was online and the dish needed a few minutes to finish calibrating. With only a few more minutes, a page loaded quickly and a speed test confirmed that our service was not only working, but working at full capacity and speed. See, my husband said to me, you doubted me. You insisted it wouldn't work. How could you not have any faith at all? But I did have faith, enough to know that I had to give that big problem to Jesus. Yet, what I came to realize later in the day, though, was that he was hurt by all my wailing and panicked accusations that he was careless and reckless, insisting that he didn't have the skills to fix it. Understandably, I was upset at the potential ramifications if he wasn't able to fix it. But I had let him have it. And that was such a wrong thing to do. The right thing to do was to extend him a little mercy, meaning withhold the berating accusations even though he deserved them. After all, I'd done some pretty awful things in my day, haven't I? I mean, gambling away every dollar that we'd owned and saved was a heck of a lot worse than breaking our internet cable. God is merciful toward us, withholding punishment and accusation when every single one of us deserve it, probably on a daily basis. It was a humbling moment, and I knew an apology was in order. I still don't know how he fixed it, but he did. And thank God that he did. I felt so badly for having reacted the way I did, and it was a great lesson on not getting caught up in the stress and anxiety of the moment. Things are going to happen, friends, and sometimes they come out of nowhere. Oftentimes, they feel like a devastating blow that could impact your life in a huge way. But always, always, we need to hold our tongues, our attitudes, and our reactions in check. He didn't do it on purpose. It was an accident. Things happen. And doesn't God always take care of us? That was such an example of what I mean when I say keeping the right attitude takes practice. Lesson learned on my part. Be merciful to others and God will be merciful unto you. In Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, he provides them with a list of Beatitudes. Beatitudes are supreme blessings that God gives to people. And one of them is this. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The story of grace being showered upon me happened two days after our big storm. The week before, I had extended an invitation to a gathering at our house on Saturday, the day of the blizzard, with some church friends. Nothing formal, just a nice meal and maybe some board games afterward. But when we all saw the forecast Friday night into Saturday, we all agreed that with the road conditions, we would just postpone it. We Michiganders aren't afraid of snow, but there comes a time where you just have to be responsible. Our pastor had even sent out a notice Saturday morning that church was canceled on Sunday. One of those church friends who owned a big truck asked if we had someone lined up to plow our driveway. If not, he would come over Sunday morning and help clear us out. I knew a local guy that I'd reached out to but wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make it or how much it would cost. So I told our friend to come on over if he could and to bring his wife along because she's a dear sweet friend of mine. I even offered to make them a hot brunch and suggested maybe we do a Bible study while they were there since church was canceled. He said he would see how the roads were and play it by ear. But that Saturday evening, I started to not feel so great. I don't know, I just felt blah and lethargic. And that night, I woke up several times, each time struggling to fall back asleep. I'd felt hot and then chilled and then hot and chilled again, and I woke up feeling stuffy and headachy. I wasn't up for company, even if that meant getting our driveway plowed. I was just, I don't know, tired, I guess. You know how it is. Some days you're just burned out. When our friends texted early in the morning and said they'd be there around 11, I wrote back and said, do you mind if I just cancel on you? I'm not feeling well. I didn't sleep great, and I was a bit feverish and chilled throughout the night. No idea if I'm getting sick, but I would hate to pass something on to you folks. I'm just tired, physically, mentally, and spiritually. They wrote back and said, of course, no problem. We'll be praying for you. 
I spent the day reading my Bible and listening to sermons and snuggled up against the wood stove. The bitter cold front was moving through, and I just could not get warm. The next morning, on Monday, I woke up feeling a bit better, but still freezing my patootie off. At about 9 a.m., I got a text from our friend, the one with the truck. He said, I just wanted to let you know I'm on my way to help you guys with the snow and whatever other chores you might need help with. Don't say no. I'll be there later this morning. I have a few stops first, and I'm going to grab a sandwich. I was so grateful. We honestly didn't have the money to pay for a plow guy, and it was pretty thick out there. We could have probably gotten out if we had to, but we have a long driveway, and some of the drifts were really tall. I knew our friend had to be back home by 3 p.m. because of work, so making him something to eat for his efforts wasn't really necessary, especially since he mentioned he was stopping for a sandwich. But it was insanely cold outside, so I thought the least I could do was make him a cup of cocoa. Like, a real cup of cocoa, with homemade whipped cream and chocolate shavings and crushed peppermint on top. Because is there any other way to do it? When he finally showed up a couple of hours later, he trudged up to the house with a few bags in his hand. I could see they were filled with food. Pasta, some canned goods, you know, that sort of thing. He shrugged at me. I don't know, we went through our pantry and pulled out some things we just didn't eat. It's all good, but figured you could use it more than we. I gave him a huge hug. This man and his wife are such dear friends of ours. We didn't even know them until late summer, after our whole church debacle. But we all started going to the new church, and we now carpool with them each week, since it's a bit of a drive for us and they live closer. I thanked our friend profusely for all the food, and went to go get my hubby, who was in the bedroom putting on some warm clothes to go out and help. Wait, just a sec, our friend said. I've got a few other bags in the truck. He went back outside, and I had an inkling to tell him no, it wasn't necessary. Honestly, we had plenty of food in our pantry. Remember how I told you guys that I stocked our pantry well these last couple of years? Our freezers were full, too. For the last few months, we'd been eating out of those freezers and pantry, putting a good-sized dent in it, but we still had a lot left over. For a few weeks, we ate from our HelloFresh gift subscription that one of my listeners got me for Christmas, but that had ended, and it's way too expensive for us to keep going. We haven't had much money for groceries, so when I go to the store, I pretty much just buy milk, bread, cheese, and bananas. I was dying for some fresh produce, since all of our meals have consisted of rice and pasta and potatoes and meat. I mean, I do a pretty good job of coming up with creative meals so we don't get bored, which lately has been happening anyway. In fact, so bored that I've even been experimenting with baking my own bread. I'm almost to the point where I'm at sourdough. Regardless, we aren't hurting for food. So while he was out at the truck bringing in more bags... I really considered telling him that we honestly didn't need it. I would prefer that he donate it to a truly needy family. But I didn't want to hurt his feelings, and I knew he took a lot of joy in being able to give and help us out, and I didn't want to take that away from him. And then he stepped into our doorway, arms laden with bags. And not just any bags, but bags filled with produce of every kind— Lettuce, and salad mix, and cabbage, and apples, and blueberries, and a huge pineapple. Jalapenos, and green peppers, and carrots. Some broccoli and cauliflower. Tomatoes, and cucumbers, and limes, and lemons, and a whole bag of onions, and a whole bag of potatoes. I'm not even joking. I'm sure I'm missing something in that list. But there was so much, and I could have wept. Oh, at one point, I actually did tear up. He could not have provided a more perfect gift at a more perfect time. We had been huddled up in our home for weeks, and even when I did go grocery shopping, I didn't have the money to spend on things like pineapple or cauliflower. At most, I've had salads maybe four or five times this winter. It's just not worth buying this time of year from our grocery store. It's pricey, and it's already half-wilted or rotted. My body had been craving a big fat salad, and this man came through. First, though, I immediately tore into the bag of apples and devoured one like a horse. 
He laughed and I laughed, but he had no idea how huge his blessing was. I knew that part of the reason I felt so blah was that we just weren't nourishing our bodies. Since moving out in the country a decade or so ago, I'd never had any concern about money, so even in the wintertime, I'd go every couple of weeks and travel an hour to a really terrific fruit and vegetable market that's located a few counties over. And before that, when I lived in Metro Detroit, even if I didn't have a ton of money, I'd always pop into one of the many produce markets to buy a few things, or splurge now and then on a salad bar. I never once found myself in a position where some peppers and lettuce mix would make me weepy. But here I was. I can't even describe to you how grateful we were for that friend. My hubby and I ate huge salads that night, grinning like little kids at Christmas. Can I say again, friends, for the hundredth time, how amazing this season of my life has been? Despite all the tough challenges and hardship, I have never, ever appreciated gifts and blessings and grace as I do right now in this time. Can I get an amen? So that was the story of someone bestowing grace unto me. Now, quickly, before we dive into the meat of this episode, let me share how God showered me with both grace and mercy. Because while my hubby was outside with our friend working on our driveway in the snowy cold, I got a message on my phone. It was someone from Facebook interested in our remaining snowmobile. Remember that? No one was interested before because it hadn't snowed? Well, it had snowed. <laughs> I did not want to get my hopes up for that one, I'm telling you. But something told me that it was going to work out. I just had a feeling of hope. When God should have chastised me for getting angry and hot at my husband for breaking the internet cable, he didn't. An act of mercy. And now, here was a local guy interested in buying our snowmobile, which would pay February's mortgage and our property taxes, with some left over for a few bills, even after we tithed. And all that was happening while I had a fridge full of produce. Sure enough, the guy came by that evening and took a test drive. And he paid us $2,300 in cash and left. And the next morning, I took it all to the bank. Isn't that so wild? Once again, God took care of us. We don't have enough to splurge on anything or buy anything extra, but his manna, he is sustaining us through his daily bread. And honestly, I don't need much more than that. I hope it's been just as heartwarming and interesting for all of you to witness these miracles every single month as a result of faith. I am not bragging. Please don't think that. I am telling you, though, that faith can move mountains, even when those mountains are property taxes, mortgage payments, and not having any salads or produce mix in the fridge. Lean on him, friends. Trust in him because he knows what you need, and you'll get through anything. It reminds me of a verse from 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, when Paul said, To keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Isn't that amazing? It's a hard concept to grasp. God saying, my grace, meaning blessings and gifts from me, only from me, are all you need. My peeps, you don't have to do it on your own or try to work your fingers to the bone to become successful or push yourself to get out of a hole or apply for the perfect job to make the perfect money to pay all the bills. Funny thing, just the other day, I went and looked at all the jobs that I had applied to, because I keep track of those, in the seven and a half months that I've been unemployed. And you wouldn't believe the number. 130. I'm not joking. I have the proof. I have applied to 130 jobs. So as I'm praying, Lord, shut the doors you don't want me to go through, that's a clear indication that he wants those doors shut. 
And I've been thinking for the longest time that it's just because there's one particular job that he wants me to have. But what if right now he doesn't want me to have any job? What if this is a season in my life to teach me to lean on him, depend on him, and to rely on his grace? Because in my weakness, there is Christ's power, right? I'm showing all of you through my podcast week after week, month after month, what it is to rely on God. Now, if I had gotten a job right away back in the summer, would any of this have been as meaningful? Probably not. It's an unnatural thing to understand that you need to be willing to remain weak because God's power works best in your weakness. As soon as you try to start taking over and make things happen on your own, you lose that power of God. When you are weak is actually when you're the strongest. It's hard to understand, but when it happens, it's pretty amazing. Again, just look at my story. Day after day, week after week, month after month, I have lived in what I would consider to be poverty compared to any other season of my life. But yet there has never been a season where I did more service for God and cared so much about helping others and have been so insanely grateful for every little blessing that has come my way. I got ridiculously joyful over an apple and a pineapple and some salad mix. Anyway, in a few weeks, I'm going to have some news about my new podcast launch. I'm still shaping things out, still praying on the specifics, but God is molding it like clay or dough, flattening and squashing some of my ideas for it, but increasing and raising up others that I hadn't even thought about before. So it's all coming together and it's going to be super cool to see what the end result is. Stay tuned for that. All right, so that was a seriously long introduction and I apologize for that. But before I dive in, (laughs) one more thing. I've got to ask you a question. Did you have abundant joy last week, folks? If not, that's on you, my friend. I don't take credit for saying this. This comes from Francis Chan in one of his recent videos. I'm just regurgitating it. But if you didn't have joy last week, that is your fault. It is. It's totally your decision and your choice not to be joyful. That is what I learned about joy. If you don't know what I'm talking about or you're new here and just picked it up in this episode, make it a point to go back and listen to my Christmas episode. If you didn't have joy last week, then you chose to focus your thoughts on the actions of other people or other circumstances that happened to you and base your inner peace and joy or lack of on those things instead of on God, instead of giving it all to God. You're still insisting that you don't trust him to carry your burdens. You heard the whole internet cable snapped story. So I'm not saying that as a human, you should pretend and be fake when you're feeling other emotions. But what I am saying is that it takes practice giving things to God. You have to work at it. And the more you do it, the more joyful you will be. And when things work out, hang on to that joy. Because the joy that I had hung on to when that internet cable snapped, and my husband put it back together, and we had internet again, lasted for a couple of days, and then was carried on by the grace of bags of produce, and then was carried on by the sale of a snowmobile. Do you see how that happens? It's legit like a snowball effect. The more you feel joy, the more you will have opportunities to feel joy. Remember Paul sitting in a jail cell writing the letter to the Philippians? In chapter 4, verse 8, he tells us, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Remember how I said before that sometimes it's neat to compare translations? I've been getting a kick out of going back to the old 1599 Geneva Bible to see what the original translation says. It states, Furthermore, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are worthy love, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, or if there be any praise, think on these things. I think I like that a little better, even though it's kind of old English. Either way, the message is very clear. Keep your mind focused on the good things 
the positive things, the things of God, and all the blessings that come from Him. Remember, like attracts like. Francis Chan shares with us that we have control over our thoughts, and I'm going to explain. Anyone can say, but I had a really terrible week. I had this happen to me, and then that happened to me, and this person made me mad, and I got overwhelmed and stressed out, and I hate my life, and why do bad things always happen to me, and I have the worst luck, and on and on and on. But I'm going to share something real quick with you. My hubby and I, we have a favorite spot to go to for day trips on the weekend in the summer or in the fall. It's a river with a gorgeous little waterfall. He loves to fish, and I enjoy hiking the trails. I always love walking up to the waterfall. I want you to picture this for a moment. Close your eyes. Well, unless you're driving, then don't close your eyes. Keep them open. But imagine that it's autumn, and all the colors are at their peak. There's a little paved sidewalk path that leads you up a grassy hill, where there are a few picnic tables scattered on the hill. There are a few to the left of the sidewalk path and a few to the right. And as you keep walking, the hill begins to slope downward a little bit, and you can hear the rushing sound of the waterfall. When you walk up to the very end of the path, there are big boulders and rocks along the shoreline of the river, and a beautiful waterfall of crashing water flows down into the bubbly river. There are trees along both sides of the riverbank, and the sun is shining brightly against the clear, deep blue sky, making the orange and red leaves shimmer and dance brilliantly all around you. Now stop and picture the scene with the waterfall and the sunlight and the blue sky and the brilliant colors, and look down and notice a squirrel. There's a squirrel, and he's scampering past you, running across the path, and he stops and turns around and looks at you. You look at the squirrel, he looks at you. Were you able to picture that scene? Wait, you were? Oh, come on now. I thought some of you were trying to tell me that you don't have control over your own thoughts. Clearly, you do. Like I said before, you have to work at it. You have to train your mind to focus on the things above, not what's happening around you. Sometimes that means legit stopping, clearing your brain, and forcing yourself to think about something else. Something pretty, something heavenly, something wonderful, a good memory, a picture of heaven, something that God did for you, something that someone else did for you, maybe something you did for someone else. If you don't fill your mind with the good things of God, the enemy will do everything he can to fill it with stress, anxiety, and fear. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have my little old brain filled with all the good things of God and heaven rather than the ugly evil things of the devil. You feel me? There's a quote I remember going around my Christian social media groups there for a while that said this, God says, don't look around because you'll be impressed. Don't look down or you'll be depressed. Just look up toward me and you will be blessed. My listener Brad sent me an email last week sharing a demon encounter that he had and asking my thoughts on it. I'm going to address that in my episode next week, and I've got a crazy demon attack story to share with you all that I've never told here before. And so we're going to talk about what to do if or when you're directly attacked by the enemy, if you actually have an encounter, something more than just the spiritual attack of addiction. So be sure to tune in. But today, finally, we're going to get back to imbalances, the addict's guide to fixing our broken lives. And today we are diving into chapter eight, the imbalance of character and integrity. Before I fell into the addiction of gambling, I'd like to think I had a pretty strong moral compass. I've made some bad decisions in my life for sure. So I'm not telling you that I was perfect. Far, far from it. But I always had a solid understanding of right and wrong. For example, When I was in my early 20s, I lived in an apartment in Metro Detroit. One Sunday morning, I had to go to the apartment's office. I don't even remember why now, but I needed to talk to somebody there about something. I walked down from my apartment and opened the door to the community center, which was dark and empty. The apartment offices were toward the back, so I headed in that direction. The door to the office only had a small window, and it looked dark in there, but it was after 10 a.m. and I knew someone should have been there. 
I turned the knob on the office door and it opened. I stepped in. Dark. Empty. No one was there. And clearly no one had been there since the day before. Whoever left the evening before had forgotten to lock the door. I started to turn and leave when something caught my eye. Sitting there off to the side of the desk was a large gallon-sized Ziploc bag about half full with quarters. I knew what it was. The apartment complex had a laundry facility, and those quarters were obviously removed from the laundry machines. I had no idea how much the bag represented. Forty dollars? Maybe fifty? Whatever it was, it was a lot to a young gal who had been working double shifts as a waitress just to make ends meet. Before I gave it a second thought, I snatched the bag up and tucked it under my shirt. Yeah, that was long before offices had security cameras. And at first, I thought it would be a good lesson to whoever left the door unlocked the night before. I scurried back to my apartment with the stolen bag of quarters safely in my possession. It took all of about five minutes of me sitting there, looking at that bag of quarters, to immediately regret what I did. Why did I do that? I wasn't a thief. Those weren't my quarters to take. I didn't need the quarters that badly. At that time in my life, I was a total atheist, no belief in God whatsoever. But even though I didn't know him, he knew me, and he let me know deep in the pit of my gut that what I'd done was wrong. I stewed over that bag for days, contemplating the idea of taking it back to the office and confessing my actions. But I was scared of what they would do. If they called the cops and I got prosecuted for theft, I could end up in jail or with a big fine. I didn't know what to do. I think I eventually did end up using those quarters for laundry and car washes, but to this day, in the list of all my many regrets, that instance is right there in big bold letters. It wasn't so much about the value of those quarters. It probably didn't even make a dent in the profit margins of the apartment complex. But I detested the way it made me feel. Like a criminal. Dirty. Shameful a person with no character or integrity. I told myself I would never do anything like that again. I always explain to people that the word integrity means doing the right thing when no one is watching. Because even if there isn't a human being around watching your actions, God sees everything. There are a lot of people who do bad things and get away with it because no human sees but we have a just and fair God who keeps record of everything, and there is a penalty for each and every sin. If you're a Christ believer, then thank the good Lord that our record is expunged and wiped clean. But for those who haven't given their life to Christ and are not interested in his provision of salvation, they're going to have to face a judgment day when every one of those things they did, big and small, will be tallied up. Next week, when I talk more about demons, I'm also going to talk about hell and what that really is. So if you want to know more about that, tune in next week. Anyway, as years passed by and I grew older, I had little things constantly remind me of how important it is to do the right thing when no one was watching. For instance, once I was at the Detroit Metro Airport late in the evening waiting for a delayed flight. I'm not usually a purse gal. I actually hate carrying around purses, especially in the winter when I can just load up my coat pockets with stuff. I have one of those winter Carhartt coats that have inner pockets as well as outer pockets. I put my wallet, my phone, my keys, and other items in there while I'm out shopping, and I'm all laden down looking like a big snowman. <laughs> Although lately, I've been kind of bringing my purse with me, which is a small crossbody, in order to ensure that I've got tissues, nasal spray, throat lozenges, and all that other good stuff on me. I still have a tiny bit of residual sneezing or stuffiness, and sometimes a bit of a scratchy throat from when I was sick. In the summer, since I don't wear a coat, I have to carry it with me. Even before gambling, I was never really into handbags or purses. Forget name brands and trends. All I cared about was, is this going to be comfortable and accessible enough to hold what I need it to hold without annoying me? <laughs> but anyways, back to the airport. I had my crossbody purse with me, and for whatever reason, had it sitting on top of my carry-on bag on the floor. It must have slid off, because I got up to go use the bathroom with the strap of my carry-on bag on my shoulder. 
I didn't realize until after I'd finished up and went to go dig for some lip balm that I didn't have my purse with me. I panicked and ran back to the gate that I'd been sitting at, which was an empty gate. I'd purposely moved away from my busy gate so that I could have some space and a plug to charge my phone while waiting for the delayed flight. I'm sure you could imagine my absolute relief and utter gratitude to find my small purse underneath the chair that I'd been sitting on. While that gate had been empty, dozens and dozens of people had walked by on the way to other areas of the airport, and that purse was very clearly visible from every angle. How someone didn't snatch it right up is a divine mystery that I won't pretend to understand. It was as if God shielded it from view behind some kind of protective, invisible force field so that I wouldn't have to deal with the devastating aftermath of having my purse, my wallet, and my phone stolen. There were several other instances like that. Once, I dropped my wallet while walking around my neighborhood in Metro Detroit. I hadn't even realized that I lost it. A day later, a woman knocked on my door returning it back to me, letting me know that she found it on the sidewalk by a curb and looked for my address and my driver's license. Another time, I dropped my checking account debit card at a park. I had just bought a new crossbody that was also like an organizer with little slots for your ID and cards. It was a stupid design because the slots weren't very deep or secure. I'd walk the trail and then come home and again didn't even realize it until the next day that my debit card was missing from my purse. I realized it must have fallen out when I'd pulled out some tissues on the trail. My hubby and I went back there immediately, and I remembered the spot where I'd stopped to blow my nose, and sure enough, there was my debit card, sitting there on the side of the trail in the dirt. I don't have time to tell you all of the other instances like this. Needless to say, God continually reminded me of how upsetting and tragic it would be to have one of those items go missing for good, to have someone come by and snatch it. Every single time one of those instances occurred, I'd think back to the quarters that I took from the apartment office, and I would remind myself of what an awful thing it is to steal from someone, regardless of the circumstances or the value of it. Since that instance with the quarters, I was definitely not a person who would ever do anything like that because I understood the grave consequences of being on the other end of having something stolen. No way, not this girl. I had too much integrity and cared about doing the right thing when no one was watching. That is, until the devil nudged the seemingly innocent little online gambling habit into my life. After that, I stole from everyone. From my bank, when I purposely overdrafted knowing I didn't have the money in my account. From the credit card companies, when I maxed out my credit lines, even after coming to the realization that there was no way I'd ever be able to pay it all back. I stole from my husband and our household, when I depleted our checking and then our savings account, leaving us with no emergency fund or means to even pay our bills. Worst of all, I stole from God. You might think that's just a vague, hypothetical statement based on the guilt of my conscience, but I'm being literal here. Remember, I manage all the bills and the household finances, and I keep the records. In 2020, we tithed more than 10% of our annual income. In 2021, we tithed even more than we did in 2020, percentage-wise. Then in 2022, we tithed right up until the very last week of July. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm looking at our spreadsheets right this moment. My last regular tithe was July 29th, the weekend of the big Mega Millions jackpot when I first discovered online casino games. Then August, nothing. September, nothing. October, nothing. In November and December, I made a few small pittance donations, which I recall doing out of guilt when I had a bit of a win that I was able to cash out, but I'm sure those were rejected as unworthy offerings by God. They weren't given with a pure, joyful heart as first fruits out of reverence and obedience and faith. They were guilt offerings and very pitiful ones at that. I stole from God. Folks, that guts me to even think about. And some of you might say, it's no big deal. God is a God of love. He forgives you. And that's true. He does in the eternal sense. 
meaning when I take my last breath and come face to face with him, none of that will be remembered. It will all be removed from my record. But there are two important things to know here. One is that if you're a believer, sometimes your rewards and blessings for faith won't be given to you until the next life. And if you're not a believer, sometimes your judgment and consequences won't be given to you until the next life. Does that make sense? That's why you see other people getting good things in this life, even though they're bad people or do bad things or simply have no belief in God. And yet those of us who do have strong faith, who are good people, who do good things, sometimes endure hardship or suffering or have bad things happen. We have to remember, too, that just because our sins are forgiven doesn't mean that God doesn't correct us or discipline us. I've said this before, but correction and discipline is different than punishment. So let's be honest here. Yeah, it was an awful, desperate, hopeless thing to gamble all of our money away. That was ridiculously tough to deal with, and I'm still suffering the consequences of that. But the harder thing, the thing that I swear to you, I can't even put my thoughts on because it's so ugly, was the person that I became while I was gambling. I had always been the kind of person who was completely honest and trustworthy. Once I was in a grocery store and there was an older woman who left her purse in the cart, wide open, with her wallet and her checkbook exposed, and she left it to go look for something in the next aisle. I couldn't believe it. I took her cart and wheeled it over to her and said, Ma'am, you shouldn't leave your purse behind like that. All it takes is a few seconds with your back turned and someone could easily snatch it up. If you don't keep it on your person, at least stay with your cart. She profusely thanked me, having realized her grave mistake. And there have been many, many opportunities for me to be dishonest and steal. Bosses who gave me their credit cards or credit card numbers while I was traveling. Wealthy friends who asked me to house sit. Times when I took the money bag filled with the day's cash to the bank when I worked in retail. But because of that incident with the quarters... I never once, not one time, thought it would be okay to take something that wasn't mine. There was even one time when I'd been at the farmer's market and all I had on me was a $100 bill. I was buying some bulk meat from a local farmer that added up to $65. The farmer's stall was busy, so his teenage son rang me up. Only instead of giving me $35 back in change, he gave me the $65 back in change. It never occurred to me to keep that. I mean, would you want someone keeping your money if you accidentally gave them the incorrect amount? Imagine if that were your teenage son or daughter. I knew it would make him feel awful. I handed him back the difference and gently explained what he did wrong. He was so grateful and I knew he'd be much more careful going forward. Remember, I have been saying all along that God rebukes, corrects, and disciplines those that he loves. Even if another human being does not see something that you do wrong, God sees it. And you wouldn't want to risk the correction he might have in store for you if you're being unethical or if you're stealing from someone in some way. This, I don't believe, at least not in my conscious understanding, was one of the imbalances that caused my downfall. But I know there are people out there who think nothing of a little cheating or a little taking. For example, I know a couple, not a Christian couple, but a fairly nice couple who would absolutely consider themselves good people who cheat on their taxes every year. They claim things they shouldn't claim, they inflate expenses way beyond what they are, and they get big returns back, bragging to everyone, insisting that taxes are outrageous to begin with. That may be true, but in Matthew 22, when the Pharisees asked Jesus if his disciples should pay taxes, Jesus told them to give what is Caesar's to Caesar and to give what is God's to God, meaning obey your government and give what they ask of you, even taxes, but also obey God and give what he asks of you. And in the end, he will make them both right. Some other examples I know of people doing wrong things or taking what isn't theirs or outright stealing without seeing it as stealing are things like taking office supplies and paper products home from the workplace or inflating billing costs and invoices to customers they know have more disposable income than others. 
or not returning a friend's tools or lawn equipment or books or mason jars when they lend them to you, purposely taking pens from an office or a retail store without asking, not putting the exact weight on bulk foods that you buy from the store, and taking condiments and things from restaurants. That was one that I had to break my hubby of. His father used to do it all the time, and my hubs truly didn't think anything of stuffing handfuls of salt packets or mayonnaise into his pockets when he was at a fast food restaurant or convenience store. My father-in-law is notorious for the statement, just take some, it's free. He says that about everything that doesn't have a price tag on it. My husband gets it now. It's not just about building your character and having integrity, but also, guess what? The store or restaurant is going to raise prices to compensate for the loss, which hurts you and everyone else. In this day and age, especially, there's such a casual, apathetic reaction to those who steal. You've got porch pirates who steal delivery packages and thieves walking into Target or Walmart, leaving with handfuls of unpaid merchandise, friends who share Netflix or Amazon accounts, and millions of people in the country claiming welfare or disability benefits when they are perfectly capable of working and getting a job. In all my time of being unemployed and struggling, I didn't once consider getting food stamps or welfare or going on disability for my gambling addiction mental health issues. Those programs are there for families with kids, or seniors, or veterans, or people who truly have physical and mental health issues and have no ability to support themselves or care for their families. I know that me taking something like that is not right, and while I might not have a lot of money at the moment, and even though I stole quite a bit in the past while I was gambling, as I explained earlier, one thing I do have right now is integrity. I don't have to prove my trust to God or to my husband or anyone, and that includes myself because I know it's already there, and I know God is watching. I'd rather rely on Him to take care of me with blessings that I know are mine and mine alone than to take blessings that are meant for other people. Does that make sense? Some of you may not have concerns about all the examples that I mentioned in today's episode, and if that's you, then well done. But if anything I said struck a defensive nerve in you, then pay attention, because I'm going to guess that's the thing that you need to work on. And if you need help with that, pray to your Father in Heaven for wisdom, who gives to all without finding fault. Your sins are forgiven, friends, but salvation is never a license for continued conscious sinning. You feel me? The last thing you want to do is continue living with an imbalance. Don't forget, imbalances lead to spiritual attack, sometimes addiction, and almost always a broken life. God bless you all, stay safe, and I'll see you again next Sunday when I read Chapter 9, The Imbalance of a Demonic Tongue. Like holy water, like sand on a bird, rain in a drought. It's all over now When daylight comes Over the long night Open your eyes It's all